assembly of people. About a year or so ago, I uh, was greeting people on Sunday morning, as we preachers love to do, and uh, one of our sweet ladies, Lenny Pelkey, who is 92 years young, came in, and Lenny is just one of these dynamic, sweet people. I mean, she is just a dynamo. And I saw her and I said, uh, Lenny, you look good today. And in characteristic 92-year-old fashion, Lenny looked at me and said, how would you know? <laughs> I thought for just a moment and I said, well, Lenny, you sound like you look good today. And she did. And so tonight, even though I am unable to see you, I am legally blind. You sound like you look really good. And it is a joy to be here in Van Buren and among these congregations that have gathered together in a spirit of unity and love and enthusiasm and zeal. Thank you, Roger, for your introduction tonight and to Chuck for the singing and to Brother Larry for that wonderful prayer this evening. What a blessing. I was talking earlier today with my good friend, Andy Clover, and uh, reminded him that I was coming this way uh, this afternoon, and Andy said, you are going to have the time of your life. He said, those are good people. And when I came in tonight, I was reminded that this congregation here at Pleasant Valley was for many years the home of another dear friend of mine, Bobby Parks. And I remember Bobby from many years ago, more than I almost care to admit now, when I was a student at Harding back in the late 70s, and Bobby was working with the School of Biblical Studies. And what a great and loving and kind man Bobby Parks was. So I know something about this church simply from your association with that good man. I want to say tonight how grateful I am personally to have my oldest daughter with me this week. As you might guess, people aren't too kind to me driving. <laughs> I, you know, I've noticed a couple of things in recent years. I haven't always been this way. But I've noticed over the last few years, nobody ever asked me to go hunting with them. <laughs> Nor does anyone ever ask me to play golf with them anymore. But uh, my wife is a speech therapist. She works with the Cabot School District. And uh, it just was not possible for her to take off during this time, this particular time of the year. And so my oldest daughter, Patty Kent, who lives in South Haven, Mississippi, just right across the state line from Memphis. Patty volunteered to drive me over and to help me out with those things that I may need help with. I know that she is really here because back at home there are five children, <laughs> including a set of seven-year-old twins. But I'm so thankful. I love her so much, and I'm so thankful. It's mighty proud for a daddy to have his daughter take such an interest in him as this, and I'm so, so grateful for that. Lord willing, this week I want to speak on the theme of revival. And tonight, I want to talk to us about reviving tired faith. My friends, you and I are living in a time of unprecedented decline in church attendance in the United States of America. I'm sure you realize that because for most of us, it's simply a matter of looking at the pews around us on any given Sunday morning, particularly since COVID-19 hit. But do you realize that 
The Gallup organization began taking surveys of church attendance in the United States in the year 1937. And in that year, 1937, which was the year my father graduated from high school in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1937, Gallup estimated that 73% of Americans were affiliated and at least attended somewhat regularly with a church or religious group of some type. 73%. It's interesting as you look at the graph line for 63 years, all the way from 1937 until the year 2000, that line remained almost constant. In 2000, Gallup estimated that 70% of Americans professed at least some type of church affiliation or religious faith. That was in the year 2000. What has happened in the last 22 years? According to the most recent Gallup survey, we are now below 50% with 47% of Americans who claim to be associated or affiliated with a church or a religious group. 47%. The fastest growing segment of our society are those individuals, particularly young adults, who, when asked about their religious affiliation, check the box that says none. That is the fastest growing segment of our population in this country, religiously, those who say none. And according to a survey that I ran across just two weeks ago, one organization is now predicting that by the year 2070, Christianity, and I use that word in a broad sense, you'll understand, will be a minority in the United States of America. Christianity will be a minority. Who, who would have thought? Who could have imagined such? In a nation that we often express thanks for having been founded by godly men, men who at least believed in biblical principles to some extent. And we often say our nation is a Christian nation, and yet the trends indicate otherwise. Now, I want to stress to you tonight, I'm not a pessimist. In fact, I tend to look at the glass as half full rather than half empty. And so when I, when, I, when I hear these statistics like this, rather than rubbing my hands together and kicking at the dust, I just think, my, my, the church has great opportunity. We have a lot of work to do. But I believe with all of my heart that the power behind us is greater than any challenge before us. Mm -hmm. I'm like the fellow that went to the jungle to sell shoes. Two men went to the jungle. The first one wrote back to his home office and said, it's no use. Nobody wears shoes in the jungle. But I like the second guy who wrote back to the home office and said, send me everything you've got. Everybody's barefoot. <laughs> and as I look at our world today, I see a world that is in need of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And I see a church of people who are capable of carrying that gospel into all the world beginning in our own communities. That's why tonight I want to talk about a revival of faith. 
You and I, in many ways, are not unlike the people who lived in the first century to whom the book of Hebrews was addressed. I'd like for you to open your Bibles tonight to that book of Hebrews. We're going to be spending the entire evening there, particularly at the end of chapter 10 through chapter 11 and into the first three verses of chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews was writing to people with tired faith. Some of them had been Christians perhaps 20, 25 years or more. They had come out of Jewish backgrounds, many of them. And now some of them were beginning to drift back into their old way of life. And that's why in Hebrews 13, verse 22, the author of this book says, Bear with this word of encouragement that I have written to you, or this word of exhortation. You know, folks, I've been preaching the gospel for over 42 years. I guess I started when I was 15, and I'm 63, so you do the math. But you know, in all of these years of preaching, and I've been preaching full time for 40 years, I have not ever had one person come to me at church and say, Brother Steve, you got to do something. I'm getting entirely too much encouragement. <laughs> now, I've had a ton of people come to me through the years who have said, you know, I, I'm kind of down. I need some encouragement. I need, I need some strength in me. But I've never had anyone say they're getting too much encouragement. Well, let me tell you, the writer of Hebrews was interested in encouraging people with tired faith. So what did he have to say to these people? Four things. Number one, he warned them about the demise of faith. He warned them about the demise of faith. I want you to look at a few passages from the book with me. Go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Notice what he says after his first chapter where he's talked about how Jesus is superior to the angels. He says, Therefore, brethren, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift from them. Do you think that's a message needed for the church today? We need to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift from them. For if the testimony of angels prove true, and every disobedience and transgression receive just uh, uh, punishment, how shall we escape? if we neglect so great a salvation. What a warning that is to Christians that we not drift away from the things that we have heard and that we not allow our salvation to escape or if we uh, uh, drift away from this, this great salvation. Now go over to the next chapter. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. And look at this warning where the writer there says, Take heed, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another, what's that word? Daily, as long as it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now what did he say? He says, listen, take heed. That's like putting up a sign that says, Beware. Watch out, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Let me ask you, do you know anyone who was once a faithful Christian, but who has left their Lord, and who through the years their heart has become hardened, and today they have a heart of unbelief? They may not even claim to believe in God anymore. That's why we need to exhort one another. And I love that word daily. Being a Christian is more is, is, is uh, not merely about exhorting one another one day a week, but it's about daily exhortation. Lest any of us be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Then go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Here the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since the promise of rest remains, let us exercise caution or let us 
fear lest any of us should fail to attain it. What the writer of Hebrews was uh, 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 illustrating here, and what he was alluding to, alluding to, excuse me, was an Old Testament event that is recorded back in Numbers chapter 13. When Israel, after they had left Egypt and crossed over the Red Sea, and they had been led by Moses up to a place called Kadesh Barnea, where you may remember Moses sent 12 spies into the land, and they brought back a report, 10 of them brought back a negative report saying the cities are walled and the people are great and there's no way we can overcome it. Only two of the spies brought back a good report. Do you remember their names? Who were they, church? Joshua and Caleb. Exactly. They said, we're well able to overcome it. Let us go up at once. But Israel listened to those ten negative spies. And in chapter 14, they rebelled against Moses and Aaron's leadership. They said, we would have been better off if you left us back in Egypt. And now, the writer of Hebrews is using this same incident, saying, since there is for us a promise of rest, just like there was for them, we need to fear, we need to take heed lest we drift away from it or lest we fail to attain it as Israel did. Now, let's keep going just a little bit further. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 for a moment. And notice if you will, Hebrews chapter 6 beginning with verse 4. For there the writer says, For it is impossible those, for those who have once been in life who have become partakers of the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted of the good things and the powers of the age to come, if they fall again, to renew them unto repentance. Now what's the writer saying there? This verse has caused a lot of controversy among theologians and religious groups through the years. But I believe the thrust of what this writer is trying to get across to Christians of his day and our day is this. Take heed for your soul. Don't let your faith slide. Because there can come a point in your life if you turn your back on God that your heart can become so hardened that it is impossible to be revealed. Now, where, where is that point? I don't know. I often liken it to this. For many years, one of my favorite places to go for private time and uh, uh, relaxation and primarily for prayer has been Mount Nebo, located just outside of Dartmouth. When, when I was a student in college at Harding, I began working with the church in Dartmouth as their youth minister. That tells you how long ago it was. But I fell in love with Mount Nebo. And to this day, I still love to go up on Sunset Point and watch the sun drifting below the Boston Mountains in the distance. Now, how far, how far could I walk out on the cliff at Sunset Point and dangle my size 12 feet off the edge mm -hmm. before I lost my balance and tumbled off into the woods below. Folks, you know what? As far as I know, there's only one way to find out, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> Did I get an amen on that one? Are you with me? How far can a person go rejecting God and rejecting God and rejecting God before their heart becomes so solidified and hard that they can no longer respond to the gospel. You see, that's a warning. But the writer of Hebrews is still not done. You come to Hebrews chapter 10 and beginning really in verse 24, all the way to the end of the chapter, there are several warnings that are mentioned there about the demise of faith. And we read how we are to 
uh, encourage one another to love and to good works. And we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some was. And all the more as we see the day approaching. And he goes on to say in verse 26, For if we willfully sin, that is, if we allow ourselves to drift back into a lifestyle of sin, then there remains no more sacrifice for that sin. For we, he says, we are actually like we're trampling underfoot the blood of His Son. Why is faith so important? Jesus talked about the importance of faith. In what's often called the silver text of the Bible, John 3, verses 16 and 17, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, His one-of-a-kind Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not the Son of the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. When Jesus gave that great commission, according to Mark's account in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, He said, Go therefore and preach the gospel to all, all, all uh, creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. When we come to the book of Acts, we find that faith was an essential ingredient in a person's response to the gospel. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas had been imprisoned in the Roman city of Philippi, Verse 25 says at midnight they were singing and praying. They were singing hymns and praying and the other prisoners heard them. And suddenly an earthquake shook the doors of the prison open and the jailer thinking that Paul and Silas had escaped took his sword and was ready to kill himself. When Paul said, do yourself no harm, we're still here. And the jailer called for a light and falling before Paul and Silas, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16 verse 31, Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And the jailer took Paul and Silas that same hour of the night and in an act of repentance he washed their stripes and then he and his household were baptized. In 1 Corinthians chapter 18, I believe it's verse 8, where we read, Luke tells us that many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. Why is faith so important? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look at this now. For by it the righteousness of God is revealed. How? From faith to faith. I'm glad this is unbreakable. Even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. A quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, two verse 4. And then in Romans chapter 5, look at this. Paul writes in verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Here's the idea. Faith. Faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. Not by works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Mm -hmm. We come on over to the book of James, and James says you believe there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. James 10, verse 17. And then in verse 24, James connects the idea of faith and works by saying, you see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. You see, the New Testament word faith is a word that means trust and obey. It's a word that is not merely mental assent, but rather it is believing something to the degree that you are willing to put some skin in the game. That you are willing to obey. Suppose this evening somewhere in this community there were a tragic fire, a house fire, in a house that's two stories tall. And as that house is engulfed in flames, standing at the window of the house 
there is a small child. The firemen are there. They have all of the rescue equipment ready. The child can be saved. But in order to do so, the child's going to have to jump from the window into the net. And the firemen and the parents, the mother and the father, are saying, it's okay. Jump. It's the only way you can be saved. The child may say, oh, mama and daddy, I believe you. I, I, I know you're not going to let anything bad happen to me. But until the child has the faith to take that leap, it will perish. And my friend, there may be those here tonight You've studied scripture, you know what the Bible says, and yet in your life you've never taken that leap. You've never put action with your faith. Tonight could well be the night that makes an eternal difference in your life. I hope it will be. So when the writer of Hebrews begins exhorting these people with tired faith, he warns them about the demise of faith. But number two, here in Hebrews chapter 11, he gives them a definition of faith. He supplies a definition of faith. Look, if you will, here in Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, he says, faith is the assurance, your version may say, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the, the men of old received their reward. By faith we believe the universe was created by the Word of God, so that those things which are seen are created by the things that are not seen. Now look at this. First of all, the writer says, here's what hope is. Hope for a Christian is confident expectation based upon the evidence of the past. You see, your hope as a Christian is not some sort of pie in the sky by and by. Your hope in the Christian, as a Christian, is not just a wishful thought. Did you ever have your, 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 your hopes set for a special present on Christmas morning? Oh, I did. I asked for a number by. I don't know, I guess I was maybe 11, 12 years old, 13 maybe. I don't remember. But I remember I asked, I pleaded, I begged, I did everything I could to tell my mom and dad and let Santa Claus know and everything else. I wanted a motorbike. Christmas morning I got up and was looking all through the gifts and I went outside and I looked around on the patio and in the carport. There was no like, I was so deflated. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't even remember what I received. I was so down over not getting what I had hoped for. But I want you to know, Christian, tonight, Listen to me now. Your hope as a disciple of Jesus Christ is real. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is based upon confident expectation based on what God has done mm -hmm. in the past. Now, look at what the writer goes on to say. He says, now, therefore, faith, the assurance of things hoped for, Evidence of things not seen. And then he goes on in verse 3, says, By faith we believe that the universe was made by the Word of God. Compare that to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Apart from Him, nothing was made that has been made. And then notice this. So that things that are seen, we know that the things that are seen have been made by those things or by that which is unseen. When I was uh, 
10 year old boy. April of one year, we had a tornado hit our house. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. We had a tornado hit our house in the middle of the night. I was a pretty hefty 10 year old. And I remember my mother coming in and waking me up, shaking the bed and saying, get up, we're having a tornado. And then she picked me up, carried me out into the hallway where my older sister was already lying on the, in the hallway and my mother dropped me. Hmm. Yep, <laughs> just dropped me. <laughs> my dad was up running through the house trying to find out what's going on. I never saw that tornado. Number one, it was at night. But number two, you don't see the wind. But I will tell you this, I sure saw what it did. <laughs> because when the sun crept up above the horizon in the morning, half of our roof was gone. And a storage building in the backyard had been blown away with its contents still in it. My dog was missing. Fortunately, we later found him and he was unscathed, just terrified. No, I never saw that wind. But you better believe I saw what it did. And for somebody to have the ludicrous idea that there is no God because you can't see Him, all they need to do is just turn around and look around in the wild. Amen. And you want to tell me that this just happened three and a half billion years ago? when some gases just happened to collide and explode in a freak accident of nature leading to an evolutionary process that has brought us to where we are today? My friend, if you believe that, I do have some oceanfront property in Arizona for you. <laughs> you see, that's what faith is. Faith is believing the evidence. Believing the evidence. Everything about the Bible is based on evidence. The Gospels. Evidence of the life of Jesus provided by first-hand accounts. Matthew. Mark. Who likely most scholars feel like collaborated with Peter himself in the writing of that gospel. Luke, who told the recipient of not only his gospel, but the book of Acts as well, these things I have written to you so that you may know. You see, everything about Scripture is based on evidence. Mm -hmm. And that's why you and I can Thirdly, not only does the writer here talk about the demise of faith, not only has he supplied us with the definition of faith, and if you caught on to it, all of these things begin with letter D, he gives us a demonstration of faith by pointing out in the remainder of Hebrews chapter 11, men and women of great faith. He starts with Abel. Here in verse 4. Who because of his great faith, the writer says, still speaks even though he is dead. I'm wondering, how many people do you know who are still speaking today even though their bodies have been dead and in the grave for years? Yet, they are still speaking. He talks about Enoch who walked with God and was pleasing to God because of his great faith. And in verse 6, the writer says, Where, uh, Wherefore, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Next, he moves on to Noah and talks about the faith of Noah. While the ark was under construction, in a world of unrighteousness where Noah was persecuted and slandered and made fun of and ridiculed. And yet, his obedience to God led not only to his salvation, but that of his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and ultimately the human race. What about Abraham, who left his home when God told him to go to a land to which he had never been? And Abraham picked up his family and his goods, and he left. What about Sarah? Abraham's wife, who when she was 90 years old, bore the child of the promise, Isaac. And what about Abraham in Genesis 22, when God came to him and that, that boy Isaac had grown, perhaps even into a young man, and God says, I want you to take him, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham took Isaac and had the knife raised and was ready. Why did he do that? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us because knowing God's promise that Isaac was the heir of the promise, Abraham believed God would raise him up. That's why faith, faith, What about uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob? Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob blessed his uh, grandsons, the sons of Joseph, while worshiping on his staff. And then, they, then Moses, his parents, hid him for three months because they saw that he was a Beautiful child. I love that. The, the, the Hebrew word was tov. Beautiful. A beautiful baby. Beautiful baby. And they hid him, putting themselves at risk. And Moses, when he grew up, because he feared the reproach, Christ chose rather than to be numbered with the, uh, or chose rather to be numbered with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's in verse 25. But what about Israel when by faith they crossed the Red Sea when its waters parted and they walked through on dry ground? Or what about Israel when they went into the promised land and they marched around the walls of Jericho and those walls fell. And what about Rahab, a harlot living there in Jericho, who because she obeyed the word of the Israelite spies, saved not only herself but her household. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the writer's not through. Because he goes on to talk about some of the judges like uh, 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 Jephthah, excuse me, and uh, Barak and, uh, and others, and Samson, and he talks about David, and he talks about the prophets, and those individuals who he says of whom the world was not worthy. What about our faith? What about our faith? You see, the fourth aspect of this text here in beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, down through verse 3, concerns the duty of faith. And this is where the rubber meets the road for every one of us tonight. Therefore, the writer says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, 
and is set down at the right hand of God. The duty of faith. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I believe the writer is specifically talking about those great heroes of faith that are mentioned back in chapter 11. But think about it. You in your life have your own great cloud of witnesses. You have those individuals who have made a profound impression on your life because of their faith. It may have been your mama or your daddy or your grandpa or your grandma. It may have been an uncle or an aunt. It may have been a friend or a fellow classmate, all of us can look back upon our own cloud of witnesses who surround us, as it were, with their personal faith that should serve as a testimony and an encouragement to us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let us throw off every weight. I mentioned Mount Nebo a couple of moments ago. I was driving up to Mount Nebo one day. And I'm sure many of you have been to Mount Nebo, and you know the road that goes up to Mount Nebo, just, I mean, about a 45 degree angle at places, and there are nine hairpin curves towards the bench of Mount Nebo. Nine of them, count them sometime. And as I was driving my little Toyota Highlander up that road, I saw this dude running up that road. But he wasn't just running. He was dragging a set of weights behind him. I, I, I didn't know if I should stop and cheer him or pray for him. <laughs> I mean, this dude is running up that mountain road pulling a set of weights. I should have just stopped and just said, man, what are you training for? Because that's what he was doing. But I'll guarantee you, when he runs a race, he doesn't pull those weights in the race. And as Christians, we're not to be pulling the weight of the world with us. Mm -hmm. as we run <coughs> with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus here's our duty looking to Jesus the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith why who for the joy set before him endured the suffering and pain and anguish of the cross to conquer sin and death. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble any earthly one. Lord, give us such a faith as this. And then, whatever may come, we'll taste in here the hallowed bliss of an eternal us have allowed our relationship with God slide. How many of us tonight need a revival of tired faith? This evening, my dear friend, if you're not a Christian, will you come tonight and in faith make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ. Repenting of your sins, be baptized into Christ. Everything's ready for you. And if as a Christian tonight, you are in need of asking for the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know that you are among people who love you. 
who will pray with you and encourage you and help you. 